the new Kung Fu reboot on The CW, and a new Jamie Foxx sitcom on Netflix are among the six new shows this week we're going to talk about. This is TV News and Reviews. Hey everybody, Dan here. This is TV News and Reviews for the week. Welcome to the show. Six new shows to talk about. TBS has Chad with an SNL alum. We've got uh, Phoebe Robinson doing her best on Comedy Central. We've got a new puppet uh, and Muppet-based show on Nickelodeon. A new superhero show called The Nevers on HBO. And the two I mentioned up at the top, Kung Fu and the new Jamie Foxx sitcom, Dad, Stop Embarrassing Me. Let's first, though, talk about the news. Not too much this week, but we do have some renewals to talk about and uh, some odds and ends as well. So in the renewal camp, Netflix has a couple of pretty big shows to uh, announce. Ginny and Georgia is renewed for season two. I reviewed this one uh, really just a few weeks ago, I guess, right? Maybe in January? Um, and 52 million households watched more than a couple of minutes of this show. Uh, I think it was later than January. I think it was like February or March. It's it's pretty recent uh, that Ginny and Georgia was on. But it's been on long enough that uh, people have sampled it and I guess want more from that. I liked it. I thought it was all right. Uh, and then Bridgerton, this is no surprise, uh, renewed for seasons three and four over on Netflix. Uh, season two, obviously, it was just recently announced that Regé Jean Page will not be uh, joining the cast for season two, but they have not killed off his character. They have uh, left the door open in case he does want to return. I think he's kind of on a rocket ride to success right now. Doesn't really want to, but, you know, this way at least he can come back for a guest spot or something. Um, and then there's a show called Warrior. I don't know too much about it, but it uh, is getting a season three. First two seasons were on Cinemax, and it's going to be moving over to HBO Max. Uh, which HBO and Cinemax have been owned by the same company for a long time. Um, and I never even thought of this, but I wonder if that's why HBO Max is called HBO Max, because of the Cinemax connection. I don't know. Um, but either way, we'll see season three of the show Warrior on there. And then a couple uh, biggies for CBS. Tough as Nails, renewed for cycles three and four. Uh, it is currently in cycle two. And then uh, NCIS with Mark Harmon returning to the helm for season 19 on CBS. And uh, it remains the number one scripted drama in all of television, at least according to the ratings. Um, and the only dramas that have been on longer in primetime, uh, Gunsmoke and the original Law & Order each have 20 seasons. So this will be for season 19 coming up. And then, of course, Law & Order SVU is... The, the reigning champ, 22 seasons and still counting uh, for that show. That doesn't seem to really be going anywhere. As long as Mariska Hargitay wants to do it and is alive, I think they'll keep doing it. Um, all right, I, I don't have any series uh, endings and cancellations this week, so let's right, uh, move right into the odds and ends portion. Some interesting things to talk about. First of all, Amazon's Lord of the Rings TV series. This has been touted for the last couple of years as, you know, being one of the most expensive things uh, that's that's ever going to be produced in the realm of television to this point. And season one, they've now uh, released a price tag. It's going to cost about $465 million just for one season. Uh, it's by far the largest price tag of any series ever. Game of Thrones, for example, uh, topped out at about $15 million an episode in that last season. And uh, each season of Game of Thrones averaged about $100 million. So why is this so expensive? Well, for one thing, uh, a big price tag that uh, they're going to, or a big expense, I should say, that uh, is going to go into that price tag for season one, but not really any of the other seasons, is that it cost them $250 million just to secure the rights to the book. So they will not you know, that won't be $250 million every single season. That's just sort of a, an upfront cost. So really, the specific season one itself uh, will cost only uh, about $215 million. But still, obviously, that's a lot if Game of Thrones was only costing about $100 million per season, which, you know, that's widely known as a very, very elaborate show with big set pieces and, and all of this. Um, so 
I don't know. I, you know, Lord of the Rings, uh, I've seen all of the movies exactly one time. They're all fine. Um, they're all even more than fine, I guess. They're very good. Um, not particularly my cup of tea. Um, so I don't know. But obviously a lot of anticipation for this show. Uh, so we'll see what happens. That's going to be on Amazon Prime. Uh, Darren Stars Younger just uh, released its seventh and final season on Paramount Plus, And they're doing um, the like three or four episodes up front and then one every week uh, after that. And then TV Land, because that was the original home of Younger, TV Land will be running season seven, uh, I guess this summer or something. But uh, once once it's completely wrapped up on Paramount Plus, they'll run it. But what's interesting about this season is that uh, Darren Starr decided to make it COVID free. When we last left the group, um, well, something happened. I'm not caught up yet. I've, I've only seen the first couple seasons. So, but the article I read reveals what happens at the end of the previous season. Um, and I, I won't say what that is, but this will take place a few months after that which still would be a good five to six months before COVID. So um, Star took a, a note from his other big show, Sex and the City, which was going through 9-11. Uh, you know, it was on the air when 9-11 happened. And of course, New York was such a huge, uh, pivotal part of that show. Um, they had a big debate on whether or not to put 9-11 stuff in the show or not and they decided you know what it's going to be better if we probably don't because then it will be more timeless and not that younger is you know on the same level of that but look with streaming these days and the whole series of younger is available on paramount plus and i think hulu as well hulu is how i've been watching it um so you know the fact that in 20 30 years people could still be discovering this show and it's a cute show i like it um you know, it may, might make sense to not have any sort of COVID plot lines in there that, that would date the show specifically. So that's interesting. Um, Jay Baruchel, who I like a lot, uh, he's going to be hosting LOL Last One Laughing Canada. It's an Amazon show in which comics will try to keep a straight face against other comics doing their material. Um, there's already several versions of this show. I think the original was in Japan, but there's also one in Australia currently airing with Rebel Wilson as the host. Uh, Jay Baruchel is very Canadian, wears it on his sleeve. He has a nice Canadian tattoo. Uh, they referenced it uh, and his Canadian heritage in uh, Knocked Up. So I think he's a good choice for this. Um, and I like shows like this. It reminds me of an old game show called Make Me Laugh from the 80s that then uh, Comedy Central revived in the early 2000s, maybe, um, where you have comedians going up against, you know, sort of just regular people doing their act and stuff and uh, making, you know, trying to get the people to laugh. If they don't laugh, they make money uh, or what have you. Since these are both comics going against each other, maybe there's some charity angle to it. I don't know. Um, in some casting news, uh, Courtney Cox uh, is going to head up a horror comedy called Shining Veil at Stars uh, Channel. And that's going to co-star two people I really like, Greg Kinnear and Mira Sorvino. Um, she's going to play, I guess Greg Kinnear is sort of the, the husband, but Mira Sorvino is an unidentified part of Cox's character's life. They haven't really revealed what that's going to be. Is it going to be an alter ego, a split personality thing, a demon? Uh, many possibilities here for this horror comedy. And of course, Courtney Cox, no stranger to that life, uh, playing Gail Weathers in the Scream series, which she is gearing up for Scream 5. Uh, I don't know if that's what it's called, but the, the fifth installment of Scream. Um, so, but uh, I, I like Courtney Cox. I think her track record after Friends has been a little hit or miss. Cougar Town was uh, kind of funny for a little bit. And then it wasn't. Uh, and then Dirt. Remember that show Dirt on FX where she played like the tabloid reporter? Horrible. God, I think two seasons, but it was very bad. Um, but I will at least sample this, of course, and uh, let you guys know my thoughts. You've also got David Beckham over on uh, Disney Plus who's going to produce and star in a show called Save Our Squad. We'll see him going back to London and uh, the soccer fields where he got his start. He will mentor a struggling team and uh, hopefully bring them some success. They'll chronicle the whole thing uh, in the you know reality-type way that they do, but that will be coming to Disney Plus at some point. And then I would say the, the biggest probably TV news of the whole week, I don't watch the show, uh, and I know very little about the, the different stars of it, but 
Bachelor star from 2019, Colton Underwood, uh, came out as gay this week in uh, a big Good Morning America exclusive. He talked all about, you know, being on the, the show and finding a, trying to find a woman and how at the time he was thanking God, you know, for making him straight and all of this. Um, and this is, you know, uh, for me, a gay man, very, very interesting. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of issues, uh, and, and baggage that, that come with coming out and to do so on such a national scale after you were the star of a show where you were looking for love with a woman, uh, a very popular show, no less. I mean, The Bachelor is huge. Bachelor Nation, you know, is what they call the fans. I've seen maybe... 30 seconds of The Bachelor ever um, when it was on the air. I mean, I've seen clips on, like, The Soup and stuff, but um, I think maybe I watched part of one of the first two seasons before I was like, this is really dumb. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not my thing. But, um, so, this Underwood dude, he's going to uh, turn his coming out and being on The Bachelor and, and really his whole story uh, into a Netflix miniseries. He had this big Catholic upbringing and all of this uh, that he's going to chronicle for Netflix. So we'll look forward to uh, to seeing that, I guess. Now that, I, I guess I'll watch. I, I like I like coming out stories, even if I don't know the people. Um, and certainly I, I don't know him from, from anything. Um, but there you go. Bachelor Nation, probably uh, very shocked by that. I don't know. Uh, all right, so th that's it for the news. Not really too much. We have no reboots this week either. That's usually a big part of news and reviews is the reboots and, uh, you know, sequels and whatnot. None of those to report this week. So let's just get right in to the reviews. Six new shows this week, and we're going to start with Kung Fu over on the CW. I actually sort of missed this one last week. There were some other things to watch, but because of that, I was able to watch the first two episodes of this show. And uh, this is set in the present day, in the, in the 2020, 2021 era, whatever. Um, and it follows a young uh, woman this time. It, the 70s show, of course, was uh, a man, and it was was it Bruce Lee and David Carradine, I think. Uh, I've never watched it, but I think that's true. Um, so this time it is a woman, uh, which certainly makes sense with the CW brand. Um, Nikki uh, Shen is uh, the character name. Olivia Liang plays her, and she uh, drops out of Harvard Law, um, to, uh, sort of help out the, uh, the, the growing criminal nature of the town. She is an expert in martial arts, um, and basically becomes this vigilante, um, after she makes uh, a life-changing journey to China to, uh, go to an isolated monastery and learn the ways. So three years later, she's estranged from her family. She's dropped out of college, and, uh, now she's going to sort of face danger herself with her martial arts skills and her mind. Uh, now, this is uh, listed sort of as a reimagining of Kung Fu, the series, not necessarily a reboot. Um, but in any event, uh, this reminded me more than anything of the recent Mulan on Disney, when they did, or Disney Plus, I should say, where they did the live action Mulan. It's, it's, it's a bit like that. Um, and, uh, it's also a bit CW'd up, of course. Greg Berlanti, the god of CW, he produces literally all of the shows pretty much on the CW, the whole Arrowverse, um, but in addition to that, you know, Riverdale, and I guess he probably does Nancy Drew, and, um, all of that kind of stuff. He has his hands in almost every show that is in any way, shape, or form, supernatural um, on the CW. And, and this one is no different. So far, um, there hasn't been a ton of supernatural elements. It's mostly, um, you know, people that, that she's dealing with. Um, and I think she is a pretty decent actress. I don't know her from, from anything. Um, so, you know, newcomer here. But uh, I, I thought she did a good job. The only other person I really recognize in the whole show is uh, her father, who is played by uh, C. Ma, who was the grandfather in The Farewell, which is an excellent, excellent movie. Um, he's been in a couple of other things, too, but that's where I, I know him most from. But um, basically, this takes uh, into account 
Nikki's family and how, you know, she's been estranged from them. And then this, this dude, uh, that, you know, knew her from back in uh, the Harvard Law days, who is now a successful DA, but he's still got some feelings for her, played by uh, Gavin Stenhouse. And uh, he is not a good actor. There's a lot of like really like hammy, soapy type actors and actresses in the show. And look, that's sort of the CW's brand, so that's fine. But where this also falls short for me is that uh, these first two episodes are very, very uh, focused on the family and on the character development, uh, which is, is okay. I mean, we need some of that stuff, but in a show called Kung Fu, over the course of two episodes, I would expect there to be some actual, you know, fight sequences. There's like a couple of short ones and they're not choreographed all that well. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe that will come with time. Like the more she learns about martial arts the better she'll be kind of thing i don't know but um other than her performance which is very solid and and uh, her father who i mentioned from the farewell also great actor there and and i don't mind delving a little bit into the family stuff but i feel like if this is a series not just a movie we've got plenty of time to do all of that stuff like it's it's one of the things that sort of uh came up when i reviewed the walker texas ranger uh, reboot on the CW as well is that it was really really focused on the family life and the estrangement and it's the same kind of stuff in, in there as it is here you know estrangement from the family and learning how to you know reconnect with your community and, and fight for justice and it's you know a lot of the same patterns that always end up in uh, the CW shows so uh, this is not one that I will stick with I, I don't stick with hardly any really of the CW shows I think the last one I watched to completion would have been Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I suppose, but that in itself is very, very not, um, not like a CW type show. It's certainly an outlier. Um, you know, it seems like it would fit in better on like Freeform or something like that. Um, but you know, overall this was okay, but I really would have liked to see some, some more fighting here. So I'm going to leave Kung Fu with a C plus. Let's move on here to the, the new Jamie Foxx sitcom. This is called Dad, Stop Embarrassing Me. It's on Netflix. There's uh, eight episodes up. And, uh, of course, you know, all the episodes on Netflix go up at once. So you could watch this all if you'd like. And I actually thought, well, this might be really funny. Uh, maybe I will kind of binge the whole thing so I can give a, a full season grade. Uh, that's not going to happen. I, I watched two. and Maybe I watched part of a third one, too. But it's really bad. Um, so let's find out why here. So Jamie Foxx plays this dude, Brian Dixon, who is a single father uh, in Atlanta. He inherits his uh, mom's cosmetic company when she passes away. And uh, so his uh, daughter, who is, I would say, late teens, early 20s, maybe. Um, I, I don't know, maybe still high school. Maybe she's like 17, 18 in that era. Um, or in that area, I should say, but after, uh, uh, her mom dies as well, she, uh, goes to live with him in Atlanta, and we have David Allen Greer as, uh, her grandfather, Jamie Foxx's father, um, and a couple other people you might recognize too, but, um, they're all trying to, you know, live together under one roof, and he is, you know, trying to be a father, but also trying to get lucky, and trying to be one with the Lord, and all of this. Um, you know, I, I was really hopeful that, oh, you know, Jamie Foxx and David Algrier coming back together from their In Living Color days would be very good. I recently uh, enjoyed David Allen Greer in the show, um, The Cool Kids on Fox, which... The show itself was like okay, but David Algrier was uh, was pretty funny in it. He was a bright spot, but man, I do not know what Jamie Foxx is doing. I, I really don't. I think he's so talented. Um, I think he was very deserving of his Oscar for Ray. Um, I, I think he should have been nominated for other things as well. I think he could have been nominated for Django. Um, I gen generally like Jamie Foxx and I like him as a person. I mean, he's showed up on the mass singer as a panelist. I think he's, he's fun on that. He does that game show beat Shazam. Um, but this turned out to be sort of uh, like a throwback to the original Jamie Foxx show back in the nineties on the WB or the UPN or whatever network aired that. 
um, because there's, first of all, it's multi-camera like that show was, but also there's talking to the camera, there's breaking that fourth wall, um, and then there's just the premises and the 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 very very tired jokes. Um, this would have fit right in place with those early WB and UPN sitcoms of the 90s, you know, Home, Homeboys in Outer Space and Steve Harvey Show and, uh, you know, the, the one where the rabbit talks. It was like Married with Children with the talking rabbit. What was that? Unhappily Ever After. Just, you know, horrible, horrible shows. Um, and I never got into the Jamie Foxx show. You know, I just didn't think it was that funny. But I've always liked him. But man, I don't know what he's doing with this show. It's not funny at all. Uh, the punchlines you can see a mile away. Um, the, and the daughter, boy, her comic timing is horrible. She couldn't find a punchline if you drew her a map. Like, it's it's just real bad. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of don't want to fail it. But at the same time, I, I, there, I can't say anything good about this show. It's uh, it's really, really horrible. Easily one of the worst of the year. I think I've only given one F so far in 2021. This is number two. I just, I can't find one good thing really to say about this show um, other than, I mean, David Allen Greer and Jamie Foxx still have chemistry together. I, I, that's the one thing I'll say about it. Um, but the writing is, is so bad that it, it barely matters, you know, at the end of the day. So uh, I think I'm going to do it. Dad, stop embarrassing me. Gets an F from me over on Netflix. All right, let's talk now about The Nevers. This is on HBO, and you can find it on HBO Max the, the day after it airs, I believe. Um, and this is set about 120 or 30 years ago. It's set in the, the late 1800s here. And uh, London is uh, overrun with touched people, is what they call them, uh, who are mostly women, and uh, they suddenly have manifested these abnormal abilities. Some are, are nice and pleasant, and some are quite disturbing. And uh, the, the movie, or the show rather, I should say, um, stars mostly people I don't really know, um, but maybe you've seen them in other things. Um, Laura Donnelly, Ann Skelly, Olivia Williams. Um, a lot of them have appeared in, you know, British shows. The only person I really recognize was Nick Frost, who has a small role in the first episode. I don't know if he's a regular. So um, they're going to do this season in six episode batches. So six episodes are going to go once a week on HBO. And then later in the year, they're going to do another six episodes. But it's all sort of tied in to one season. Um, and basically, there are some uh, champions of the touched that are, are very happy about them. But then there's also obviously some detractors who want to, you know, stop them from existing, etc. Um, it, it's interesting. We see nowadays a lot of these shows, in fact, several in the last few weeks. Like I just did one last week on Netflix called The Irregulars, um, where, you know, we, we have normal people who have some supernatural powers all of a sudden or something happens and they have them or, or whatever it is. But they're sort of thrust into this. And, and Irregulars even takes place right around the same time because it's it's a Sherlock Holmes-based show. Um, so it takes place probably in the 1920s or 30s or something. This takes place maybe 30, 40 years before that. Um, the most notable thing, I guess, about this show is that it was created by Joss Whedon. And uh, he directed the first two episodes um, and, and wrote the pilot. Um, but he's had a lot of issues lately in his career uh, with some, you know, uh, harassment charges and this and that. So he has exited after these first six episodes. He's exited the, the program completely. And uh, other than episode five, which he also directs, he doesn't have anything to do with uh, the other three episodes of the season. But uh, I, when I heard he was a part of it, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to at least maybe be interested in this because I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel was also very good. Um, but I I'm not sure if he's lost his touch or if he just, um, I, I don't know, got too too big for uh, himself and people weren't saying no to him. But this show is kind of a mess. Uh, for one thing, there's way too many characters that they've introduced just in this first episode. I mean, there's probably 10 or 12 characters that they want you to like know and know what their deal is and, and all of that way too many for a pilot 
where it doesn't exist in our universe. So really, we should be honing in on, you know, maybe f five or six people at most and their abilities and, and, and everything. So you don't get to know any of these characters over the course of an hour and three minutes of the first episode. You really don't because ev there's just too many people to, to talk about. So everybody gets maybe a scene or two. Um, but, but then uh, the other problem I have with it is at least half the show uh, takes the viewpoint of the men of the series who are not touched. They're the ones who, you know, want to basically get rid of the touched or whatever, um, you know, military dudes who are skeptical of, of uh, the touched and what they could do and everything. And, and so instead of getting to know the characters that the show is about, the touched, um, we we get to know, I would say, more about these other people's, you know, sort of the villains, and it's fine, you know, if you have a great villain, but I think we we get their their point of view in a scene or two. We don't need to spend 25 minutes or whatever of, of the pilot with them. Um, so there, there's just a lot of, like, conversations happening about what are we going to do about the touched? Well, I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to meet the touched and, and, and see what, you know, what what uh what makes them tick and what what made them touched and and what are their abilities and, and whatever and we just don't really get a lot of that um nick frost's character is sort of like in their group he's a, he's a regular person he's not one of the touched but he uh you know is working with them to sort of um you know l give them the, the dirt on like what might be going down but at the same time like he can't really be trusted either because he just works for himself so you know he'll just as easily uh, sell him down the river too so you know his character is at least mildly interesting but we mostly see him with the women because he's sort of you know dealing with them and talking to them and, and that was good but uh yeah this is just a mess all over I, I i really i hope it finds its footing i guess um but at the same time with everything going on lately with joss whedon i don't really care if it succeeds or not um you know i don't, I don't really <laughs> want to support him um, but when you compare the two, you know, last week uh, or the week before we had the Irregulars, now we've got this, uh, I much prefer that show to this one. I think the acting is better as well in that one. Um, uh, so I'm going to leave the Nevers with a C minus. All right. So up next, we're going to go to TBS for Chad. This is a show, um, starring, created by, uh, and written by and starring Nassim Padrad, who used to be on SNL. She did Kim Kardashian. She did, um, I'm trying to think if she did any other famous people. I know she had a couple of nice weekend update segments. But um, anyway, she was always just, you know, kind of a, a great team player uh, on SNL for several years. And, and she uh, does have a look about her that she could pass as a, a teenage boy. And that is what this show is. She plays a 14-year-old a uh, Persian boy named Chad, who is a freshman at uh, his high school, and he is basically, you know, sort of an outcast. He's a nerd. He lies in the first episode and pretends like he had sex over the summer so he can, you know, uh, get some cred, but then that ends up blowing up in his face. I won't say how. Um, so originally this was pitched to Fox in 2016, which was shortly after she left SNL, or maybe she was even still on SNL at the time. Um, and it just sort of languished for a few years. Um, and then in 2019, TBS had ordered uh, a 10 episode season. And uh, this is one of the shows that like critics seem to love and the audience doesn't seem to get. Critically, it's at an 82% on Rotten Tomatoes uh, and audience wise, 13% very hated. I think part of the reason for that is uh, this is very like uncomfortable cringy type of uh, storylines cringy type of dialogue it's realistic but it's it's in that way that you just you feel so bad for this character um that you know you, you just it's it's hard to watch you know because it's not a bad character you kind of like this kid you know you want him to succeed and uh things just keep going wrong blowing up in his face what have you um but the problem is where where i defer a little bit more to what the audience uh, is giving it on Rotten Tomatoes is that uh, it's just not that funny. Um, you, you know, I, I love comparing things on this show. There's there's no secret about that. But the thing I compare this to the most, um, because it's also 
um, you know, older women, in this case, probably in their 30s, playing high school kids is Pen15, which is one of the best shows on right now. I love Pen15. It's hysterical, but it is also very cringy. You know, you, you feel for these girls because they're just so lost in, in, in how to be, you know, cool and how to be with it and how to make friends and, and the whole thing, how to get boys um, that, you know, it just doesn't work out. You feel so bad for them, but it's hilarious in the process. This show, the jokes are really missing. It's it's just cringe. And, and I think that's a big big downfall. I think Nassim Pedrad uh, is funny, and I think she does a good job uh, conveying this character to us. But on the whole, um, it, it's just cringe. I wouldn't call it cringe humor, because it ain't that funny. They're just, where are the punchlines? I don't know. Um, and I was only able to view the first episode of this show. That was all that uh, the TBS app would let me watch. But um, I, I would like to see this move in a funnier direction because I sympathize with this character and, and the plight in this first episode um, about, you know, a, a rumor gone wrong at school. I, I think many of us have been there and it's in that way relatable, but it's just not funny. So I'm going to leave Chad with a C plus. Uh, up next, we're going to talk about The Barbarian and the Troll. This is on Nickelodeon and it's not specifically, I don't think, through uh, the Henson Production Company, but um, it stars Drew Massey, who has worked extensively with the Muppets and the Henson Company. So um, he's he's definitely a pro in that regard. But I don't think this show is specifically a Henson production. But uh, this is airing on Nickelodeon. And uh, it basically, uh, Brendar is uh, sort of our, our lead here. He's uh, voiced by Spencer Grammer, um, who you might know from voicing Rick and Morty. Um, I, I don't think he's either Rick or Morty. I don't watch that show, but I don't think he's one of the main characters because I think that's the creator. But, um, but it's him and this Drew Massey as Evan sort of are, are the team here. And, uh, basically they're fighting, um, uh, you know, different things here. Um, so Spencer Grandma, I'm sorry, I said he, it's, it's actually a girl. So I know she doesn't voice Rick or Morty, um, because those are obviously two dudes. But uh, she voices somebody on that show. I know that. Um, but she is a warrior princess. And uh, she's on a quest to, uh, you know, find her family. Uh, or avenge, I guess, her family. Um, and and their, their crises. And basically she meets Evan along the way. Who is a bridge troll and wants to come along. He's kind of a bard. So he sings songs throughout. And uh, they're just trying to save the kingdom. And in, in the first episode they go to... Uh, or maybe it's the second episode. I did watch two. Um, they go off to see this wizard and, and get his blessing and, and luck uh, for the quest as well. Uh, it's a cute show. It's funny. Um, it is adult. It's funny it's on Nickelodeon because it seems more like, I don't know, almost an adult, uh, not adult swim because it's not like dirty or anything, but um, a lot of the jokes I, I think would kind of go over kids' heads just because they're like, either more dated references or um, not necessarily body humor, but maybe on occasion something a little bit off color the kids wouldn't necessarily get or whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it would fit in, in with uh, Fox's animation domination. I like that Nickelodeon sort of um, going back out to its sort of uh, ribald roots a little bit. You know, you can't do that on television was big when I was a kid, which was very, very sort of naughty and and my parents were like this is not f for you you know and i'm like well it is you know it's nickelodeon um so i like they're sort of embracing that side of themselves again and the muppets is the way to do it because you know people forget that in the 70s the muppets were originally designed really for adults um and, and it just sort of went into being a kid show because they were so funny and so cute and whatever um the music here is great each episode has at least two original songs uh, from the ones I've seen so far, and they're catchy songs, um, and uh, it's it's just a, a fun show. I like the voice work. I like the puppetry, of course, because, you know, Drew Massey worked with the Muppets and everything, so the puppetry's great. Um, it's it's funny. I mean, this, this is definitely one of the brighter spots so far in 2021. I didn't really know what to expect at all. I've been... The Nickelodeon shows seem to lately be either 
like really surprisingly good or just rotten and terrible. Um, and, and I think we've seen both here the last couple of months on Nickelodeon. Um, but I really, really enjoyed this show. Um, I don't know, uh, what happens, like, if it's, if the whole entire series is them going on this one quest, or if they're going to kind of wrap it up and then do another quest. I would sort of like maybe each season to be its own quest. That could be interesting. Um, cause I think there's only so far you can like stretch this you know, sort of basic premise. But uh, I like what they're doing so far. I leave the Barbarian and the Troll with an A-. minus. So finally, we're going to wrap up with uh, this comedian, Phoebe Robinson. And she's got a new show on Comedy Central called Doing the Most with Phoebe Robinson. And basically, she uh, gathers some of her celebrity friends. Uh, in the first episode, for example, was Whitney Cummings. But in uh, subsequent episodes, you're, you're going to have Kevin Bacon and the Property Brothers and uh, other things like that. And basically, uh, she's from Two Dope Queens, if you've ever heard of that podcast. I think it might have been a show, too, on HBO. Um, but I know the podcast was hugely successful. She's from that. And this is sort of like um, she's going to visit her buddy uh, in, in whatever the particular episode is. And they're going to uh, show her how to do something or introduce her to you know, some lifestyle that this person enjoys. So Whitney Cummings is, uh, which I didn't realize this, but is huge into horseback riding and horse raising and all of this. And so Phoebe went to this farm, uh, you know, that Whitney is, is a member of or, or whatever. I don't think it's her farm, but, um, you know, they, they rode horses together and Whitney was like telling her about it. Maybe it is, maybe it was Whitney's farm. I can't remember, but, um, but this is very funny, you know. Um, again, I, I know I compare things to other things, but that's how uh, I feel like it, you can grade things. But uh, Burt Kreischer was doing something similar over the summer or in the fall or whatever on Netflix. And I can't remember what that show was called, but it was really bad. It wasn't funny. Um, and here, you know, I don't think I was uproarious with laughter, but um, I think it's it's a better concept because nobody is really trying too hard like I like Burt Kreischer but in that show I feel like he was trying way too hard and he was also trying to cause drama and obviously much of it was very very obviously scripted here we don't have any of this Phoebe Robinson is uh pretty natural in front of the camera um since she does know Whitney yeah they already have a little bit of a rapport so they're sort of playing off each other I liked that um and Whitney Cummings I think is also funny so this first episode I, I got a lot of laughs from because I think both of them were funny. Um, and I don't know, I, I sort of like the concept of people trying new things, doing new things. I think it's what's great about um, that Jeff Goldblum show on Disney+. Plus. Um, you know, the, there's a Stanley Tucci one that's very popular. I haven't seen yet, but it's another one like that sort of concept where he's going to Italy or something and trying different restaurants out or, or something like that. I, I like that concept. It's so very basic, um, but if it's done well, it can be quite entertaining. And, uh, you know, I don't think this, the concept of this is breaking new ground, but I, I like the execution of it for sure. So I'm going to leave doing the most with Phoebe Robinson with a B. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, you know, short and sweet this week. I don't think any of these needed to be really delved uh, into that deeply. Um, they all are, are fairly uh, ex self-explanatory within a few minutes. And uh, we didn't really have that much news either to start. So uh, pretty pretty quick episode this week. So next week, we will do it all over again. More TV news and reviews for you. Uh, but thanks for watching. Until then.